Section 4.6 is about a topic called related rates, and they usually come in the form of a word problem. So uh, before we begin, I want to go over some necessary concepts that you need to remember about notation, specifically the Leibniz notation. So this first question um, under the review asks for the rate of change of y with respect to x. So just recall that that Leibniz notation is going to say dy over dx, and that's how you express a rate. And just keep in mind that a rate is just a derivative. So the derivative of y with respect to x is just that rate of change of y with respect to x. Number two says the rate of change of r with respect to t. So that would just be dr over dt, how r changes over time. And that variable t is going to be our independent variable because when you're looking at the rate of something, how fast something's happening, it's over a length of time. So question number three says the area is increasing at a rate of 10 square centimeters per second. And I would write that dA, I'm just going to use that capital A to represent area, over dt equals 10 square centimeters per second. And that's how you would write that statement. And notice the units when your units are the rate of change of area over time. Then I'm looking to have an area unit over a time unit. And review question four, the height of the river is decreasing at a rate of three feet per hour. Again, I'm going to use h to represent height over time. Now when a rate is decreasing, that means it's going to be negative. So this would be a negative three feet per hour. And again, if you have dh over dt, height over time, then your units need to represent that as well. Feet per hour, because feet is your height over your time, which is measured in hours. Questions five and six are just going to remind you about that notation and how to find the derivative. In question number five, this just says d over dx of 2x to the fourth. So that Leibniz notation is saying, let's do the derivative of this 2x to the fourth with respect to x. So that means x is our independent variable. In other words, you're just going to do a derivative as normal, and we're going to say that is 8x cubed. An initial look at number six, it looks the same, but it's really not, because this says the derivative of 2y to the fourth with respect to x. And that discrepancy in variable, because this is asking me to do the derivative with respect to x, yet I have a y sitting here, that's when we used implicit, which was just the chain rule. So the way that we did that, just think of that y as an inside function. I'm going to do the derivative of the outside, so 8 y to the third, leave the inside alone. That's why I left that y alone. There was an additional step where you had to multiply times the derivative of the inside, dy dx. That is just implicit differentiation going on, which is just the chain rule. The bottom line is when you have a difference in variable, you have one extra step to multiply by the derivative of that inside function with respect to that independent variable. In the next section, I have the steps for solving a related rates problem won't really make much sense until we do one. So we'll just kind of follow the steps as we work through the first example and a little bit of helpful information in the box off to the side over here. When you're asked to write a rate, a rate is just a derivative. So d whatever over dt, a rate is measuring how something changes over time. So that will always be a dt on the bottom. An increasing amount means you have a positive rate. A decreasing amount means you have a negative rate. And these next two points will make sense when we do the two examples on the back. But basically what it's saying is you're not allowed to plug your values in until after you differentiate unless you have a constant that remains constant throughout the entire problem. So let's look at this first one. We have a circular plate of metal heated in an oven. Its radius increases at a rate of 0.01 centimeters per second. At what rate? is the plate's area increasing when the radius is 50 centimeters. Our first step is just to maybe draw a diagram and label it and uh, figure out what we know and what we're trying to find. I'm going to go ahead and label the steps as I go through them in this problem, but you don't really have to do it as long as all the work is there. Uh, so step number one, I have a circular plate and uh, the only measurement for a circle is a radius, so my circular plate with a radius. I'm told that the radius increases at a rate of 0.01 centimeters per second. And the keywords here 
is that this is a rate that it increases, which means it's going to be positive, and I see the unit is indicative of a rate as well. You said above that you're going to write a rate as d something over dt. That something in this case is a radius, so I write that as dr dt. My question wants to know at what rate is the plate's area increasing. Again, this is a rate, so I'm going to use that rate notation, dA dt equals, and I don't know what that is, that's the, what's going to answer this question for me. I also know that the radius is 50 centimeters. Step two wants me to write an equation relating the variables. So I just look at my question and it's talking about area. It's talking about a circular plate. It's talking about a radius. So I'm just going to use the area of a circle formula. So step two is simply a equals pi r squared. In step three, I'm asked to find the derivative of that formula with respect to t. And notice that I have a variable of r here. So that's where my chain rule is going to come in, my implicit differentiation. We're treating r as our inside function, so we're going to do derivative of the outside, so we're going to bring that 2 down and subtract 1 from it, so it's going to say 2 pi r to the first power, but because that is an r and I'm doing the derivative with respect to t, I have an extra step to multiply by dr dt, the derivative of the inside with respect to t. My next move is to combine what I did in step one, laying out all my given information with step three, that differentiated formula that I came up with. dA dt is what I'm gonna to try to find, so that's gonna stay my variable, so it's just gonna say dA dt. And I've just got my two pi that's part of the formula. In for the radius, I'm gonna put my 50 centimeters. And in for my dR dt, I'm putting my 0.01 centimeters per second. I'm going to go ahead and carry the units through this, uh, the centimeters and the centimeters per second. You don't have to do that, but it will help us to see that what we're doing is actually the right thing to be doing. So now I just have to calculate my answer. So dA dt, if I just take all the numerical part of this, the 2, the 50, and the 0 0.01, and multiply all that together, that's all just 1, with the pi is just going to leave a pi. And if I work with those units, I get centimeters times centimeters per second, and that gives me centimeters squared per second. And the reason I did that was to just demonstrate that you end up with an area unit over a time unit, area over time. And that's my final answer, and the last step is just to summarize that. So the area is increasing at a rate of pi square centimeters per second. It's okay to leave it as pi, but if you want to write the decimal equivalent, you could call that 3.141 or 3.142. You can either truncate, which is the first one, or you can round, which is the second one. You just have to make sure that you go three decimal places out for, uh, for your final answer. So any of these three that I have written here would be fine and that unit is a necessary part of things. If you had carried the units through the calculations like I did, it's just going to naturally occur square centimeters per second. But if you didn't uh, carry the centimeters and centimeters per second through the calculations, you would know what the unit was supposed to be because it is going to be a area unit over a time unit. So you just have to make sure you put area over time and that'll get your unit correct that way as well. Let's take a look at another example. In example two, we have a 16 foot ladder that's leaning against a wall, and the base starts to move away. So the base is being pulled out. As that happens, the top of the, the ladder is sliding down the wall. And it says when the bottom of the ladder is five feet from the wall, it's sliding at a rate of three feet per second. Find the rate at which the top of the ladder is sliding down at that moment. So the top is not sliding down at the same rate the bottom is sliding out. So the answer is not just three feet per second. Let's go ahead and label what we know. We know the ladder is 16 feet. We know that uh, the bottom of the ladder is 5 feet from the wall, so that means this x distance right here, x is going to be 5. I know that it's sliding at a rate of 3 feet per second, so it's a rate, so that's my dx dt. It's the rate of change of x, so that's going to be dx dt is 3 feet per second. And the question wants to know how fast the top of the ladder is sliding down the wall at that moment. 
So the top of the ladder is moving in this direction, sliding down the wall. So it wants the rate of change of y. And I can see that that amount, as this ladder is moving down the wall, I can see that that, that height up the wall that it's hitting is shrinking, it's getting smaller. So that means I'm looking for a negative answer. So I'm looking for a dy dt, the rate of change of y with respect to time. And uh, what I know is that's gonna be a negative number. Let me go ahead and continue on. Step two wants a formula that relates all of these variables. And what I see in my picture is a right triangle. And uh, it's got two legs, x and y. The hypotenuse is locked in at 16. So I'm going to use the Pythagorean theorem. Notice when I wrote this formula, I went ahead and I plugged the 16 in, but I did not plug the 5 in for the x. And the reason is because as this ladder is in motion, that distance from the base of the ladder to the wall is constantly changing. So when you have a, an amount that is constantly changing as that ladder is in motion, you're not allowed to plug it in. However, the ladder is always 16 feet, no matter when you look at this scenario. So I'm allowed to plug in an unchanging amount anytime during the problem. But if it's an amount that's changing, like that length on the bottom, I'm not allowed to plug it in until after I differentiate. That's what my little note here off to the side is referencing. Because the ladder's not changing, I'm allowed to plug it in anytime. We'll look at what would have happened if you would have missed that detail. And you'll see that it doesn't really matter. You can end up with the same answer at the end. What step three wants me to do is do the derivative with respect to time. When I do this derivative with respect to the variable t, yet I've got an x and a y here, I'm going to have to remember that implicit part. My derivative is 2x. And that discrepancy in variable requires that dx dt be multiplied on the back end of that. And then derivative of y squared, 2y dy dt. The derivative of 16 squared, because it's a constant, is just a 0. I'm ready to plug in my amounts now. The 2x dx dt is just going to be 2 times the 5 times the 3. I'm going to go ahead and leave the units out of the calculations just to simplify this a little bit. When I get to the part of the formula where I need the y, I look and I don't have a y listed. However, at that moment in time, when my x is a 5 and my ladder is 16, I can use the Pythagorean theorem and I can find what y is. So I run off to the side here and I do Pythagorean theorem and I get y equals the square root of 231. I'm going to delay turning that into a decimal because my final answer needs to be accurate to three places. And if I round the answer now, it's going to start affecting that accuracy. So I'm just going to use that as a square root of 231 in my calculation. So in for the y, I'm subbing in a square root of 231. The dy dt is what I'm solving for, so that's going to remain the variable in my equation. And now all that's left is just algebra, and what I'm solving for is this dy dt. So I'm going to take this 30 and subtract it to the other side. When I'm done solving, I get this negative 30 divided by 2 square root of 231. When I type that in the calculator, I get the decimal answer negative 0.986. That's the truncated answer, and the negative 0.987 is the rounded answer. Actually, any of these three answers would be acceptable. Step number five, I'm just going to sum that up as my answer. I've got two ways that you can say this answer in step number five. The first one says the top of the ladder is sliding down at a rate of, and you could pick any, any of these three answers really, uh, 0.986 feet per second. Notice I didn't put a negative on that answer, and the reason I did that was because this word down gives it a direction. So if you use that word down, I do not need a negative on that numerical answer because that implies it's going downward and implies that negative rate. If I don't say the word down, and this is what the red answer is saying, the top of the ladder is sliding at a rate of negative 0.986 feet per second. Notice here I didn't give it a direction of movement, therefore I did put the negative on my answer. And when we're thinking about this problem, I went ahead and stuck the units on your answer, and it's important for you to put the units on the answer, but I didn't carry them through the calculations. If I had, they would have just naturally come to be feet per second. But what I did on that one is I knew I was looking for dy dt, and I knew my y is measured in feet, and my t is measured in seconds. So I knew that dy dt was going to be feet per second when everything was said and done. So I just stuck it on the end. Okay, one more example to do, and this time I have a right circular cone, 
and the radius and the height are changing at a rate of two centimeters per second. How fast is the volume of the cone increasing when the radius is 10 and the height is 20? Let me first lay out all of my given information. My radius and my height are changing at a rate of two centimeters per second. That's my dr dt and my dh dt are both gonna be two. How fast is the volume of the cone changing? When you're asked for how fast something is changing, that is a rate. So it's the rate of change of the volume. So I'm gonna call that dv dt. And that's what's gonna answer the question for me. And I wanna know what that rate of change is at the exact moment when the radius is 10 centimeters and the height is 20 centimeters. Step number two wants me to pull out a formula that relates all of these variables. This is talking about the volume of a cone and the radius and the height. Usually a formula like this would be supplied to you, but if you forget, you can look it up easy enough. So the volume of a cone is 1 3rd pi r squared h. My next step is to take the derivative with respect to t. And this time I have two different variables and they are both changing. So the radius is constantly changing, the height is constantly changing. So I'm not allowed to sub any of those values in. If one of those were a constant throughout, it would actually make this problem a lot easier because I could substitute them in at the front end before I differentiate. But the way this problem is, I'm gonna have to do a product rule um, and I have to employ implicit differentiation because both of these variables are changing. When I do that product rule, and there's different ways you can do this, but I think what I'm gonna do is treat that 1 3rd pi r squared is my first, and that h is my second, and I'm gonna go through my product rule, and also remember to do the chain rule. So my dv dt, here's the first half, the product rule, here's my first, times derivative of the second. Derivative of h is just a one, but because that's an h and my derivative is with respect to t, I gotta do the dh dt. Plus, now I've got my second, which is the h, times derivative of the first. When I do that derivative, I'm gonna bring that two down and subtract one from it, times the derivative of the inside function. So there's my derivative, your product rule, with a chain rule embedded. And now I'm just ready to substitute in all my known information. I'm trying to find dv dt, so that's gonna remain my variable. And this equation has a lot of variables in it, but as long as you can cover all of these variables with your given information that you did in step one, then you're good to go, and I can do that. So now I just have to crunch all these numbers and pretty much that's my answer. The choice is yours whether you want to uh, leave this in terms of pi or if you want to turn it into a decimal. If you do choose to write the decimal, make sure you go three places out. The first one is truncated, the second one is rounded, and any of these three answers are acceptable. And my last step is just to summarize this and make sure I put units on my answer. It doesn't matter which of these three you pick, they're all equally correct. Just make sure you put the units on there. I didn't use the units through the calculations like I did on the first example. You are more than welcome to do that, but what you could do is just take a look at what you're finding. You're finding the rate of change of volume over time, so make sure your unit is one of volume, which is cubic centimeters, over your time unit, which is seconds. These related rates problems come in many different types, but just make sure you follow the steps, make sure that you follow any product rules, any chain rules that show up, get lots of practice in, and you will be fine.